In the first deposition, I had all the evidence. I had him saying these lies on video, and he realized as the case went on that kind of we had the goods on him, and he got increasingly unhappy as the deposition went on. So I said, sir, <laughs> we have, uh, I just have one more topic I want to cover, and then we'll break for lunch, if that's okay with you. And he looked at me, and he said, well, why do we have to break for lunch? Let's just go straight through. This is a waste of my time. And then you could kind of see the wheel spinning in his brain. And he said, well, you're here in Mar-a-Lago. What do you think you're going to do for lunch? And so I said to him, well, you know, I, I raised this question with your attorneys yesterday, sir. And they graciously offered to provide us with lunch. At which point there was a huge pile of documents, exhibits sitting in front of him. And he took the pile and he just threw it across the table. Because he was mad video. you were going to eat lunch? Because they'd offered us a free lunch at Mar-a-Lago, yeah. Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to George Conway Explains It All. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and because I am not a lawyer, I have asked my good friend George Conway from the Society for the Rule of Law to explain the legal news to me every week. But on today's show... We are going to talk to super lawyers Robbie Kaplan and Matt Craig, who just won the $83 million verdict against Trump. 83.3. 83.3. Yeah, point, yeah, don't forget the point three million. Three, yeah, yeah. Well, we could you just could, leave it out. You do a lot for $300,000. Ah, that's true. But you know what? In this verdict, it's so big that $300,000 is a Absolutely. rounding error. Amazing. It, my producer Amazing. didn't even put it on the sheet. Yeah. Uh, and so she won this verdict in the E. Jean Carroll defamation case. Now, I know a lot of you are watching us on YouTube, uh, which is great, but I want you to all take out your phone, go to whatever podcast app you use, search George Conway Explains It All, and then hit subscribe and give us a five-star review. Yeah, by the way, this isn't George Conway Explains It All. Today's episode is going to be Robbie Explains It All, and I am going to basically just sit back um, like the, you know, the old guys, the Muppet guys in the, in the, in the, in the balcony. Yeah. 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 In, in making jokes. Great I'm just going to be here for, I'm just going to be here for comic relief. And, and that, that's, that's, it's going to be ask, ask Robbie Kaplan, who's, who's going to explain it all. That's what, that's what this show is going to yeah, be. Yeah. You guys aren't going to want to miss it. I tell you, we, we laugh, we cry. There are incredible anecdotes. <sighs> Break some news. We're going to get right to our episode with Robbie Kaplan and her colleague, Matt Craig, who are two of E. Jean's Carroll's lawyers. I hope you guys enjoy this. Robbie and Matt, welcome to our podcast. Such an honor to have you. For folks who don't know, Robbie Kaplan is a renowned litigator who is probably most famous for representing Edie Windsor at the Supreme Court, a case that struck down the Defense of Marriage Act and paved the way for marriage equality. And as somebody who got one of those gay marriages, I just want to say thank you personally. Uh, and my, my kids, thank you. And uh, so that's just a huge thing. What do I get? You you just hold on, okay? okay? And I'm going to talk about Matt. So Matt Craig has worked alongside Robbie representing E. Jean Carroll since 2019 and was the trial counsel in both trials. So congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Now, Robbie. So much winning. So, so much, much winning, winning on, the, on our screen here. It's just amazing. Uh, now, Robbie, George likes to take credit for your representation of E. Jean uh, Carroll. Let's not overdo it. I just was like at the right place at the right time in that spot in the universe that just happened to matter that one instant okay well why don't you just just tell us so how do you know each other and how did it come to be that you introduced uh robbie and Eugene carroll well this is actually a a a, a good story because it allows us to talk about yet another case that robbie has against the donald which is a case called acn and i'll have her describe that but basically, I was sitting in my office in New York. I was before I retired, and I, I read about this case that someone had brought involving this scam called ACN that was something that Donald Trump and his kids were pushing on The Apprentice. And I read the complaint, and I said, wow, this is a really well-done document. And then I saw it was done by Robbie, and I knew who Robbie was by reputation, and I I direct messaged her, I think, on Twitter and said, this is an amazing, you're doing an amazing job here. This is a great document. And then we had lunch and then we became friends huh. and lived happily ever after. That's the end of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, we're done. Did you, Robbie, did you, did you, I mean, obviously maybe other side of the aisle politically from George, uh, were you equally impressed with his litigating ability? Oh, stop. <laughs> I was so much more impressed with his litigating ability, Sarah, than he was with mine. I don't even know where to get. That is not true. That is not true. <laughs> I, I worshipped you from the very beginning when we had Same that first here. sushi lunch. 
And so and we, I don't think we were ever in cases together. No. I was trying to remember. Uh, we didn't have that many cases with Wachtell at Paul Weiss. No, that's true. I mean, we ha- I've had some, but no, we, I have some with Brad Carp and some other people, you know. And so you're at a party, and you meet Eugene Carroll, and you're at Molly Jonk Fast House. Well, yeah, what happened was, Molly. yeah, no, that, we'll, we'll tell that story next. Yeah, so we became friends, and, and so, uh, you know, uh, Robbie was, is doing the Lord's work in many ways. And one day, this story comes out in New York Magazine. Uh, it was like a Thursday afternoon or something, and, and um, in June of 2019, and I read this story, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, there's a real pattern here of what this guy has done. And I really focused on the whole pattern and I tweeted some stuff out about the pattern of his behavior. And then I re- re- thought about the fact that the Trump campaign had brought out Juanita Broderick and trotted her out after the Access Hollywood tape and said, you know, B- Bill Clinton raped this woman. And she told her story again. And I realized um, as I was studying through this, I, uh, they, 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 in the next week, I, I realized Jean's case was much. Jean's case was much much stronger because she actually had contemporaneous witnesses who she told immediately after the fact, and and there, there are a bunch of other reasons. So I wrote a piece in the, an op ed in the Washington Post in June of twenty nineteen, saying, "Hey, Republicans, don't be hypocrites. If you think that Juanita Broderick was brave, well, then you should be standing up for E. Jean Carroll, which of course they did not." And then it just so happened that um, a few weeks later, and I think it was in, it was June what fifteen I think it was uh, twenty nineteen. And I I go to this party at at, at Molly Jong Fast's apartment on the in Manhattan, and it had to be a little later than that, George, because the statements were made June twenty one. No, no, July, July. I meant July, right? It was July fifteenth. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, that's right. It was June was the, when the statements came, and it was July fifteen, and I think July sixteen was when I put up uh, something like that. Was the email I sent to you guys? And I see there's there's Eugene Carroll, and I say, "Ma'am, glad to meet you." She's an elegant, tall woman. I, I thought, you know, I had no idea she was pushing eighty. It was crazy, but she's you know, and she was she was very nice, and you could see there was a lot. She was kind of, you could see the weight on her shoulders. I mean, she's a very, very exuberant woman, and she was very friendly, and, and, and you know, she's just, she's, that's Jean Carroll, but you could just feel the weight on her shoulders, and she told me, you know, she knew who I was. She thanked me for the piece, I think, that I had written in the Post. I think that, that she did that, and I said, you know, I, I, I praised her for her courage, and she said, you know, some people are saying I, might, I should sue. What do you think? In essence, that's, I don't remember the exact conversation. And I thought for about a millisecond. I mean, literally within two seconds, I said, you have a claim. Because, you know, my thinking was, this happened. I'm sure he's lying. I'm sure she's telling the truth. And he's lying publicly about her, calling her a whack job and a liar. That's defamation, period. Yeah, although, Robbie, did you think it was a a case? Like, so George introduces... E. Jean Carroll to you, and when you heard- well, let me let me finish the story. Okay, sorry, so the, 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 this is this is a two minute conversation, and and I explained to Robbie, I mean, I mean, not Robbie to G- E. Jean, like, yeah, okay, this would be a civil case for def- 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 defamation, the um, a criminal case for sexual assault. The, the statute would have run, although um, you know uh, the criminal statute would have run, and then and then I thought, oh, I know who can represent her, and I don't think I told. E. Jean at that time, who I was thinking of, but I said, I have an idea, and give me your email address, and I'll get back to you. And the next morning, I, I think I, I emailed or emailed or called Robbie and asked her if she'd be interested in talking to Jean, e. Jean Carroll, and then I sent this email, which I, you know, which was I think at 8:47 a.m. On, on the 16th of July, 2019, and that's you know, and then I went on. Do you my remember business. the date and time, Robbie? Was it that was it that important to you that you've got it? No, no, no. I found the email. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. You went back and looked at it. But tell me, did the the question I was asking is, did it feel to you when you looked at it like, yes, this is a case, no doubt about it, or because when I think for a lot of people it seemed like it had been such a long time ago that there was no way that this was something that could come back and really be meaningful. I think people are shocked at how this has gone. So, you know, upon seeing the email, I'm not sure I thought anything one way or the other other than I'd be certainly willing to talk to her. And then, man, I don't know if you remember, did she, because was she in the city and came by that day or the next day? I remember a time in around that time when she came into the office. I remember seeing her there and, and being intrigued. I actually wasn't sort of involved at that, that in those first couple of days, but 
but I think it was soon after that she, that she showed up in our Empire State Building offices. Yeah, so she came to our office and we just talk, start to talk. And like George, the fact that she had two contemporaneous outcry witnesses, uh, neither of whom seemed to me would have been, even though they're close friends, would have been willing to lie for her. Um, and and kind of how charming she was, how there was no pre-existing or continuing relationship with Trump. In other words, she wouldn't have been interested in Donald Trump, really. <laughs> she didn't want to do business with him. She didn't want to be on his shows. She lived in a very different world than he did and, and kind of was at the pinnacle of her success then. So it just felt to me like a very credible story. And when you thought about what he was saying, which is it didn't happen at all, you had to think back that either E. Jean and her two friends in 1996 came up with a lie to be able to tell about Donald Trump later when he got elected to be president. I mean, that's just insane because no one would have thought that. Or when he was elected president, they came up with this lie, but then they waited three years till E. Jean's mother died to tell. Like, none of it made any sense. Right. So I thought it was a pretty strong case from the very beginning. We certainly knew, as we later learned, that there were going to be major complications with the fact that he made the statements while president. I mean, we weren't completely dumb about that. We knew that was going to be a problem. But on its facts, I thought it was a pretty decent case. Yeah, and I, I, I remember the thing that, that really struck me was... I think the New York Times didn't play the play the story up that weekend of the first the first weekend, and then people said, "Well, this is a major story, guys," and they kind of made up for it by doing a, an, a recorded interview with Carol Martin and Lisa Bernbach, and I listened to that, and I'm uh, that was what convinced me, and I said, "Okay, this 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 happened. This absolutely freaking happened." And that's what, what that was my mindset when I met uh, Eugene at that party. That, that just that's what sold me. Um, absolutely. I say that the story itself, Sarah, is just so bizarre. Like, who would make up a story like that? Like, <laughs> you're in Berg, you're coming out of Bergdorf's. You run into him. She remembers very significant details, which ended up matching what the people, the two witnesses we had who worked at Bergdorf at the time said about the layout of the store about how they walked around, about how it was pretty empty on a, in the evening. The one night of the week it was open in the evenings then was Thursday. It was just, too, like, if you're going to make up a story that Trump raped you, it wouldn't be, A, it wouldn't be so weird, and B, you wouldn't make the concessions E. Jean made. Like, she testified on the stand that, well, I hate to get gruesome about this, but while she absolutely remembered the pain and the feeling of him invading her i hate to you know i hate to i'm we're really very prude so i hate to talk about the details but with her fingers she wasn't sh you know she and she felt his penis she didn't think it was that long and she managed to push him off if you were gonna make up a lie that's not what you'd say yeah right and then and then the other thing for me that i always thought was our ace in the hole was carol martin i had grown up in new york city in law school with carol martin being a tv newscaster and everyone knew who she was she's an african-american woman who really worked her way up through the ranks in TV news. And to me, the idea that Carol Martin would lie for, e even as close as they were, would lie for E. Jean Carroll was just preposterous. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of the problem Trump has all around is he lies about everything and he tells whoppers that he doesn't necessarily need to tell. I mean, the whoppers here was, I never, I never met her. And, the, you know, and, and the New York Magazine article that came out that revealed this story had a photograph of them together. Okay, and he, you know, and he watches television obsessively. Okay, and and Gene Carroll, E. Jean Carroll was on TV. Okay, right after no Roger Ailes' show. Yeah. right after Roger Ailes' yeah. show. Yeah, and, and and the other thing, and the other lie was, I mean, <laughs> she's not my type. Okay, oh, you didn't. So the woman accuses you of rape, and you say, no, I didn't rape her because she's not my type. I mean, it's just classic Trumpy crazy. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, as 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 E. Jean put it, I think she testified. She said she thought the lie that he would tell would be it was consensual, right? And that's what you know. He he just he can't help himself, and it's just craziness. And it just it just you realize he's lying, and she's telling the truth when you when you factor in the two, you know, the two the two outcry witnesses. That's I mean. So Robbie and Matt, 
I do focus groups every week. Uh, and for lots of the people that we talk to, the cases against we Trump did, are like... We did our own version of those, Sarah, preparing for the trial. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I would love to talk about that sometime. But what's what's interesting is, is how the cases uh, are for these voters, which is they're like white noise. They can't tell them apart uh, from each other. And one of the reasons George and I started this podcast was to help me as a non-lawyer and other folks like me sort of make sense of what was going on. So if you could distill this case down, like what are the one or two things that you think are important for people to understand about this case? So I think the case, I said this this morning, I think the case has two primary elements. One is the bravery of someone like E. Jean Carroll, um, who was, in my view, completely rational in 1996, deciding not to report this to police, the police not to do anything about it. It would have been horrible for her had she done that. But who lived with this pain for many years and who, frankly, since she's so kind of always have a smile on your face, I can face anything, yeah. I'm a gonzo journalist and I can be as tough as the guys, really for many years refused to acknowledge the ways that it had hurt her, which I found kind of extraordinary. And so it's a real story, I think, for a lot of women in her generation and others who just endured this in silence. I, I think that's a huge piece of this case. And then the other piece of the case is the unbelievable, I know John would call, I mean, I know George would call it pathological narcissism of Donald Trump. And the idea that he just can't, he just doesn't think the rules apply to him in any way, Absolutely. shape, or form. Whether it's sexual assault or it's lying in court or it's defaming someone or it's not respecting the judge, the pattern is so is just so blatant. Um, and that's why the verdict was so much bigger, I think, the second trial. I mean, there's other reasons for it under the law, but it's because he showed up the second time. Yeah. <laughs> and when you say he showed up... There's actually a lesson for the election here. Um, the re he's he's not going to do as well in the polls as he's been doing when people start seeing him again behaving the way he behaves and one of the things i think that politically has to be done to, is for people to point out when he's not behaving the way a normal human being is behaving it drives him nuts and it's a cycle and 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 what happened to in front of this jury i, I think is going to happen again in, in in public matt i know you wanted to say something go ahead uh, I was, and, and this is actually built on what george was saying but i think and what Robbie said last, which is sort of his behavior is just so out of step from what I think we expected from, or what one might expect from a typical litigant. But I think if you understand it as not having to do with the case at all, but fitting into a broader picture, you can really understand everything he does as trying to appeal to sort of a slice of the electorate. And it, it explains all his behavior in court, why he was doing things that he thought would help in New Hampshire. Um, but we also saw that a jury of, of nine New Yorkers last May and a jury of nine New Yorkers here sort of rejected that. And I think there was a lot, a lot of other people that rejected that. So I think it could be hopefully a preview of what's to come once, once he has to speak or try to speak to a broader audience. Um, but I, I think he showed for this trial that he's not, not fully able to. The other thing for your purposes, Sarah, is the first jury, uh, we had a very different complexion than the most recent jury. The first jury were mostly people I think we had one person from New York City, and everyone else was from Westchester and Putnam and Orange Counties. Putnam and Orange Counties are pretty red. Um, they're pretty Trumpy, and we managed to even convince those, including some guy who listens to Tim Pool, yeah. to my everlasting horror when we realized. <laughs> but even he voted, you know, he voted with the jury to say that he did it. Like in an hour, too, right? I mean, it was... It was and that, that guy, the Tim Pool guy, I mean, in his void ear, didn't he... In, 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 on the transcript, I think it said that he got all his news from that podcast or something like that, right? I mean, yeah. In the initial contest, we thought he said Temple. So I, I'm so stupid. I thought he might have been an Orthodox Jew. <laughs> and you, I was like, he no said deal. Tim Pool, and you heard Temple. What? And I the court reporter did too. It's on the transcript. It's on the transcript. It was incorrect, but then the some journalist Temple. picked up on it, right, and said, yeah. "Oh, I know what that is." And that's how people sort of found out about it. Judge Kaplan does this very fast, Sarah. So it's like, boom, boom, boom. You can barely hear what the people are saying. Uh, that is a great little note. But when you guys are talking about Trump's behavior in the trial, actually, I think a lot of people 
listening don't know what was Trump doing that you think the jury was reacting so strongly to? Well, where do we begin? <laughs> Matt, you started, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll finish. I mean, this will be. We can make this a second episode. Yeah, yeah. I, say, uh, go on and on. I I mean, a couple things. One from the get go, including in in opening statements, he was sort of audibly reacting to things that our side would say that continued to when Eugene was on the stand and it felt Wait, let me let me get before that when we were doing jury selection one of the questions was do you believe that the 2020 election was stolen and he raised his hand <laughs> well who, like, whose opinion like, matters after all <laughs> it's like a Judy it's something like someone you know like somebody Wait, Trump raised Trump his hand, hand when he, yes yes the jury of course he would yeah he he <laughs> Absolutely would do that. I, and I don't think that's for effect. I just think he can't help himself. I just, I just, I think, I think Judge Kaplan, when he said, and you can tell the story about, I mean, I don't think the guy can help himself. Okay. So that's great. Keep, keep going. Keep going. Tell yeah. me more. Yeah, so, so that, that sort of, sort of the reactions he had continued during openings into Eugene's testimony. I mean, that's when it started. I think we, we started to, to say things to the court because we would have his statements on the screen and he would repeat them out loud so the jury could hear. He called her a whack job, he called her a, a con artist, sort of in front of the jury. Um, and, and it seemed, it's a bit, I think, of not being able to help it, but he also, I think, is trying to slip in a back door defense of like, it's actually true, I didn't do it, I'm still sort of speaking my truth, um, which, which was sort of out of bounds for this, this second trial. Um, so I think after enough of that, um, we we said to Judge Kaplan to sort of put it on the record that he was doing these things. And this is what you're referring to, George, where Judge Kaplan eventually said something to, to Trump and, and Trump said, well, you know, sort of reacted strongly. Judge Kaplan said, you can't help yourself. Uh, Donald Trump says no. And he gets up, throws his hands up, walks away. Um, and that's that's day two of trial. Um, yeah. So it, it picked up quite quickly. And, th and then combined with it was like a two man show between him and Haba. Like, so Haba was saying things in this courtroom, Sarah, that I, George and I, only George and I can get this because we're the same age and we both came from big firms. The idea that any lawyer sitting in front of Judge Kaplan would say the kinds of things that she said, like every time she said it, my, like, I think my blood pressure went up. Like, give me an example of what she would say. So the very first case, she said to him, I really don't appreciate the way you're talking to me. <laughs> to the judge? To the judge, but not even in that nice a tone of voice. She was kind of yelling at him. And I literally thought I was going to have a heart attack. Not that I said it, but the stress of never knowing what she was going to say and how Judge Kaplan was going to react. He's not known as being like the sweetest judge out there. It was unbelievable. What yeah, other kinds of things did she yeah. say, Matt? I can't even remember. It, you know, it's she, like when you're a kid, right? And you're and and I, I never had siblings, but I'll bet you it's like when your sibling acts out, you're terrified for them because of what your parents are going to do. Yeah, right. Even though That's you are right. the angel and you're just sitting there, and it's like, oh my god, you get you you get sick. <laughs> and, and I've had that feeling in court. Not like not like this, I'm sure. But, and I think what she did. I mean, there was I think a lot of the media picked up on some of the the ineffectiveness in introducing evidence and asking questions. And that, you know, at some point during trial didn't become quite as surprising. But what remains surprising is when there'd be a ruling from Judge Kaplan, and he said this multiple times, that she treated it like the opening of a conversation and tried to push back after he had ruled, asked a question yeah. that he had just said she couldn't ask, but with a slightly I've different way. I've seen she lawyers do that. They, they will do that, you know, particularly criminal defense lawyers. They will do that. Because you got to keep, sometimes you got to keep pushing a judge, but you have to be respectful when you're doing it. Yeah, that was and, the and when you're pushing back on a judge, you have to do it respectful, respectfully. And, and her disrespect for Judge Kaplan, I read, the, you know, I read large chunks of this transcript, was palpable when the, when the court would say, you need to do this correctly, whatever that was, she'd say, okay, sure, judge, or sure. Like, you know, like she's talking to some. Say, uh, like I thought a, you would say that. Like, yeah. and, and and what you say is yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Is what you say, and then you 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 follow the instruction of the judge, right? I mean, that's that's what I was always trained. I, I think you said so. I had another case in front of Judge Kaplan, 
where I was arguing and I basically was saying to him, look, if you rule the way the other side wants, you, you should just admit that there won't be any pleading standard under this body of law. And he looked at me, he looked down at me and I said, oh, I'm, I immediately, I was like, I withdraw that, Your Honor, I never should have said it. <laughs> All I said is admit there's no pleading standard. She said three dozen times a day things so much more disrespectful than Absolutely. that in such a more disrespectful tone of voice. It was nuts. And when he was, when Trump was there, it was worse because he was clearly ordering her out and egging her on. Well, this was my question is if Trump in the courtroom was playing for New Hampshire voters, who was she playing for? Was she doing this because she thought that's what kind of representation Trump wanted? I think so. What do you yeah. think, Matt? Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah. It, and, and as Robbie said, the tone changed what, depending on whether or not she was in the room. Uh, Trump was in the room. Also, many of the objections she made came from Trump notes that Trump passed her or taps on the shoulder that Trump gave her. Um, it wasn't it wasn't driven by sort of a deep legal strategy. I think it was driven by the one man. Let me bring it back to the first trial, because the first trial, he actually had a competent, extremely experienced a well-known criminal defense lawyer, and he's a bit of a flashy guy, and he may not be my type or your type, but he, he was pretty good at what he did. And by the end of the trial, it seemed like, just from looking at the transcript, that he was kind of throwing up his hands when the judge would call him out for something his client had done, and his client wasn't even in the jurisdiction. I mean, could you tell us about a little yeah, of that dynamic? Right. So it was much to a much lesser extent because he wasn't there, but Trump was live tweeting <laughs> during the first trial in ways that were obviously in violation of, of stuff that the judge had said was off limits. And it happened, what, three or four times, Matt, at least? And every time it would happen, it shows how the world has changed because he just did it throughout this trial. But every time it would happen, we'd raise it with, with the judge. The judge would call Takapina in. And Takapina would like kind of agree that it was inappropriate and just say, look, judge, I'm doing my best. And I actually think Judge Kaplan was sympathetic to him. Yeah, he uh, knew, that, he, he knew that, he, that, that Takapina had a client that was out of control. Anyway. I mean, even here, remember when, when Judge, what did she say? Judge Kaplan, so in the second trial, there, there was a, a discussion about what ju uh, Trump could say on the stand right before he took the stand. And, and Judge Kaplan asked Alina... Okay, what are you going to say and what are gonna, his answers going to be? And she kind of said, as I recall, something like, I can't really tell, I can't predict. I know she said, I don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> so I can't really tell you what his answers are going to be, Judge. Well, that's actually very honest of her because, you know, you never know what's going to come out of, of that guy, man's brain and then therefore out of his mouth. I mean, but then if, she, if he was the one egging, I mean, it seems like, <laughs> once again, we're firing people via tweet uh, knockoffs. <laughs> But so, you know, he kind of, it seems like he is parting ways with her, that she will no longer be his counsel. So, like, how can he be mad at her if she kind of did what he wanted in terms of, like, that performance? Because it's all about money, my friend. Well, For him, it's, it's all about the money. And it's never his fault. Nothing is ever his fault, well, right? Let me ask we you about the Ask money. anybody who worked okay. for him in the Trump administration, right? It's I have never noticed the this fault. pattern yes. with him. It has not escaped me. So, like, because this podcast is about me asking lawyers to explain things, practically speaking, how does a jury decide damages in a case like this? And it's as, I, as I'm listening to you guys, I'm thinking, did they? Did he cost himself eighty three million dollars by just being such a jerk? Like, is it how much of it actually had to do with her case, and how much of it had to do with the fact that they just decided? And this goes to your political point, man. I really hate this jerk, uh, and I want to make him pay. Sixty five million of the eighty three was. He's being a jerk. Huh. Yeah. And, and I, I remember I, I, he actually got off easy, I think, in some ways. I, I mean, I don't I mean, the, the 88.3 was is just a remarkable achievement. But, you know, you can award they could have they could have made it a lot worse and it would still have been sustained on appeal for this guy. Because I think, you know, you really don't get into um, appellate courts cutting back punitive damages award unless you get to like eight or nine or ten times the compensatories and here the compensatories were i think understandably on the order of 20 million dollars and and compared to the three million in the first case because this was the these were the first lies that he told and he told them 
um, he used the bully pulpit uh, to tell these lies. He was president at the time. And those amplified the effect of his lies. So this guy could have easily, I mean, you could, if you had, they could have gone five times. I think this verdict could, he, he actually was lucky that this verdict wasn't 100 or 120 million. Do you I guys think. agree with that? Do you, were you not surprised to see such an, uh, an unbelievable sum of money awarded? Go ahead, Matt. I, I, I can say for myself, I, I, think, I think we would never have said a number that high out loud. Um, but I, I think we believe strongly that, that punitives in this case had a lot more work to do than perhaps in the typical case. And, and given sort of the ramp up of lies and defamation that occurred from the first trial through the second, I think we all felt very strongly that it should be a very high punitive award. It's just tough to know exactly what a jury is going to do. And we didn't put a number on it for the yeah. jury. We had given them sort of targets or ranges for the, the two components of the compensatory damages, um, but didn't say anything about punitives. And yeah. in the first case, the punitives that the jury awarded were much smaller than compensatory. Um, and, and so it was tough to expect anything. Uh, I think we were very happy with the result. Yeah, we uh, should be very happy and should be very proud. It's amazing. Oh. But let me say, I think uh, my friend, Shanlin Wu, who is a commentator a former Justice Department lawyer and a, and a legal commentator for CNN. I think he wrote something for, I think it was the Daily Beast, and he made the point, like, Trump is lucky this, this case didn't get, um, get to the jury on a Monday or a Tuesday because he, his theory was they could have gone higher and they probably just sort of settled on 65 because they, they didn't want to come back on Monday. So, it, you know, I, I, that's, that's pure speculation, um, and, but it's just... You know, th this there is no, but the point really is there's no way that this verdict gets overturned as excessive. It's just never going to happen. And I don't know what, I, there's, there's no reversible error anywhere I could I can think of. And, you know, he can go interview 100 lawyers if he can find one will work for him. And I, I, I think this these verdicts are bulletproof. Can you explain to me, because we get, uh, we, we put out a thing saying, eh, ask George and send us no, your this questions. Is, this is ask Robbie. And everybody sent in this question for you guys, which is, is he going to have to pay these damages? Oh, great question. The, the short answer is yes. The longer, the more interesting question is, what's going to happen in the near term? So within the next 45 to 60 days... If he wants us to be to not be able to collect while he's appealing, which is standard in a civil case like this, he either has to post a bond, which would require him to put 20 percent down, or he has to do what he did last time, which is the first time I've ever seen anyone do this, which is put the entire amount on deposit with the court. Which means um, that which so means that Eugene is guaranteed to get that money. Correct. Absolutely. Unless, unless there's the, yeah, I mean, if it's affirmed, she, she, they, that, that, that money in the court account gets dispersed there. He had, he had that money? He had the 5.5. Oh, that money. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think there, I, I don't know where, he, there's something I think I read that it may, might have come from the Trump Corporation. I don't know. I mean, there's some issue with, with that, but I'm not going to elaborate because I, I, I haven't done the research. I always do research first. Okay, so she gets that five, but what about the rest of it? So, so he's going to, if he wants to appeal, he's going to have to do something similar. Where he's going to get the money from, Sarah, I have no idea. But otherwise, he's going to have to allow us to start we trying have to so collect much money. Home. We have so much money. It's right. It's hard for him money. to say. This is. Yeah. He said in the, in the AG deposition that they had $400 million in cash at the Trump board. And you know, he's always telling the truth. <laughs> Uh, that is, uh, well, that's good news. Well, okay, that's speaking wild. of hundreds but, of millions of dollars, can, can, are you still on, want to, I want to ta talk about the, about the other case that you have, because people have not focused on this other case that you have. The case that, as I mentioned before, got me just cavelling over, over Robbie. Tell us about that one. And wh when is it going to go to trial? This is the ACN case? Yes. Uh, we're on appeal now. Sadly, it's a ways off. Oh, um, yeah. So this this case is really, I mean, it, again, it's kind of another classic example of the way he behaves. So at a certain point, Trump, as everyone knows, real, couldn't really do real estate projects in New York because it requires banks to lend you a lot of money. And they weren't willing to do that. And he had the brilliant, truly brilliant, I have to say, uh, idea that he could basically make money by marketing himself. And one of the first things he did in that regard was to promote this very scuzzy multi-level marketing scheme called ACN, 
or American Communications Network, which appealed to very kind of generally poor working class people. They would. This is where I think he got the the taste for the rallies. They would come to these big stadiums to hear him speak, and he would say kind of a spectrum of lies ranging from, I know investments, I know real estate, this is a better investment than real estate, to, uh, I did a lot of due diligence and this company's great, to my all-time favorite, which is people think I'm just doing this for the money, but I just really like the company. Oh, God. What is a multi, multi-level multi marketing scheme for those of us not familiar, um, for those people so out there not familiar with with this um, highly advanced form of fraudulent behavior. So it's basically a pyramid scheme. Even among pyramid scheme experts, this one is considered to be among the worst. Um, and he had these people on a uh, celebrity apprentice twice. We got the outtakes for both episodes. We also deposed some of the celebrities uh, who were on. And suffice it to say, it's all quite eye-opening, to say the least. We're on appeal now because the judge wouldn't certify a class, um, and then she dismissed it without prejudice for lack of jurisdiction. We're just going to appeal it and hopefully come back soon. Let me ask you, um, so you ended up taking his deposition in that case as well as the Carroll case. And as I I think you ended up taking them almost back-to-back, one week week to the next— That must have, I mean, you know, one of the things that litigators like to do, and they will do it for the rest of their lives, is tell war stories. That must have been a trip. I want to hear the deposition stories. Let me me begin by saying the first, they weren't supposed to be a week apart. The first deposition was supposed to be earlier in this ACN case. Um, But there was, remember that big hurricane in Florida? (laughs) The big hurricane was coming to Florida. We wrote them and said, look, maybe we should just do this in Bedminster, guys. Like, there's a huge hurricane coming to Florida. And they were like, no, no, no. And then as the hurricane's approaching, they shut down everything in Florida. They still insist that we have to come to Mar-a-Lago the day after the hurricane to do the deposition. We finally write a letter to the judge saying, judge, I'm really sorry, but this is how the tornado looks. We got it like on the Doppler. My partner, (laughs) John Quinn, put a picture in the letter of the hurricane. Did you did like you did you circle. did you embellish it with a sharpie? <laughs> yeah, we should have. <laughs> and, and so the judge said, obviously, you don't have to fly to Florida today. It was postponed, and, and it was postponed until uh, the week before the other one. So the first one, first of all, was in a very different. They were in different places. The first one was in that big ballroom. Maybe not be the biggest ballroom, but the ballroom where you see all the boxes of doxes of, of documents. That's where it was. The famous ballroom. Um, oh my gosh. He, um, they didn't have any smaller rooms for a deposition. You needed to be strange. in the ballroom. Wasn't was that also strange. the room where he, he physically assaulted one of your witnesses? No, I think that was the s- I don't room. think so. Yeah, that was that the was other was thing he had going for him is the pattern. Of, 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 oh, my you know, gosh. Hold he, on. You got to tell all these. Go, go ahead. Tell them all. So at the first deposition, and, and he was really, it was a very different style of deposition because In the first deposition, I had all the evidence. I had him saying these lies on video. I had him signing the documents. I had receipt of all these millions of dollars to him from this company. And so it was just really confirming the evidence. And he realized as the case went on that kind of we had the goods on him. And he got increasingly unhappy as the deposition went on. He kept saying, as I recall, that he was like Tom Cruise selling a car. And then you're in a car crash and you sue Tom Cruise. What I didn't say back to him is that would be true if Tom Cruise had an advertisement to sell a car and he said it has the best airbags in the industry and then there was an accident and the airbags didn't exist. <laughs> That's the kind of lie that Trump told, in which case you could sue Tom Cruise. Right. So he's just getting increasingly irked at, uh, during the deposition. We're Imagine about that. Mid, we're about mid, mid-ish morning, 1130 or so, and I say something like, I didn't know what to call him, um, so I decided on Sir. So I said, sir, we have, uh, I just have one more topic I want to cover and then we'll break for lunch if that's okay with you. And he looked at me and he said, well, why do we have to break for lunch? Let's just go straight through. This is a waste of my time. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I would do that, but we have a, a court reporter, we have a videographer, they're entitled to a lunch break, we have to break for lunch. And then you could kind of see the, the wheel spinning 
in his brain, you could really almost see it. And he said, well, you're here at Mar-a-Lago. What do you think you're going to do for lunch? Where are you going to get lunch? And so I said to him, well, you know, I, I raised this question with your attorneys yesterday, sir. And they graciously offered to provide us with lunch. At which point there was a huge pile of documents, exhibits sitting in front of him. And he took the pile and he just threw it across the table. And because he was mad you were going to eat lunch? Because they'd offered us a free lunch at Mar-a-Lago, yeah. Right. And, and, and this is something, Sarah, I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever had a deposition taken or attended one. No, I you, have no legal problems. Right. When you, well, that's my job. That's why I have. So <laughs> when you yeah. host a deposition, whether it be at your law offices or at your client's offices or any place, it is customary to order lunch and get your adversaries a separate conference room where they can eat that lunch and do whatever they need to do during lunch and talk privately. And then you have your own conference room where you eat lunch with your client and so on. It's, it is standard operating procedure. Very civil. Very civil. And he flipped out that yeah. his lawyers had done. He really done. for that. He was yeah. so mad at Alina. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I hope those weren't nuclear secrets. Well, there was, was no ketchup. Over. Fortunately, the <laughs> yeah. ketchup had not yet been delivered, so it did not <laughs> smear the well, floors apart. Yeah, but then he came back in and he said, well, how'd you like the lunch? And I said, well, sir, I had a banana. You know, I, I've never really eat when I'm taking testimony. And he said, well, I told you. It was kind of charming. He said, I told you. I told them to make you really bad sandwiches, but they can't help themselves here. <laughs> we have the best sandwiches. Yeah, he can be funny. There's no question yeah. about it. Uh well, what you know what one part that I saw that I did not think was funny uh, was when he was asked he was doing the whole like when they're a star they let you do it oh, uh, yeah, like yeah. that was a wild thing to catch yeah, tell on us tape. about that and and, yeah. and, so that and the was, photograph story about the de the deposition that you played at, at the at the first trial. Yeah, so let me let me get you there. So, so I'm still at the 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 fraud deposition. We go through we end about four o'clock in the afternoon and. Um, we come in the room and I say, I'm done asking questions. And immediately I hear from the other side, off the record, off the record, off the record. Um, so they must have planned it. <laughs> and he looks at me from across the table and he says, see you next Tuesday. For the and second I, deposition. I, was the deposition on a Tuesday, counsel? And I, well, no. No, I don't think it was. We'll look it up, but I don't think it was. And I, thank it God, <laughs> had no idea what that meant. So I said to him, what are you talking about? I'm coming back on Wednesday. <laughs> Which literally it was an honest answer. I had no idea what he was talking about. Then we get into the car. Did he respond? My, Wait, did he did he laugh? But they or said, something? "See, they said it was sort of like in a deliberate way, right?" I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, I thought, he, you could tell it was like it was like a kind of a joke again, like teenage boys would come up with. Yeah, but again, no, that I is a teenage boy joke. level joke. Yeah, I wasn't in on the joke, so I had no idea. Then we get into the car, and my colleagues are like, "Robbie, do you know what that means?" And I'm like, "No, what are you talking about?" They tell me, and I'm like, oh, my God, thank God I didn't know, because had I known, I, I for sure would have gotten angry. There's no question I would have gotten angry, and I didn't because I didn't know. So I was super polite, <laughs> and I looked like I was being above it all, which I wasn't. I just didn't understand. <laughs> um, so then That's we just an back, amazing story. <laughs> we come back the next Wednesday for the uh, deposition in Carroll, and that was very different. On that deposition, I really just wanted him to talk. I mean, I just knew that he was going to say crazy things. And the only thing I needed to accomplish was I wanted him to confirm that his theory of the case was never met her, never happened. Right. I wanted to make sure that that's what I was defending against. or That's what I was prosecuting my case against the trial. And we're pretty early in the morning. And Matt, you should say what you remember. And he starts to talk about, I'm kind of getting him to confirm this defamatory statements he made. And he said, oh, yeah, you know, they showed me a photo where we were together. And I, I wasn't really trying to be a trickster at all. I said, well, I think I have a copy of that photo. Let me show you. We pull it out. And I said, is this the photo? And he starts to look at it. And he literally points uh, at Eugene and says, that's Marla. I don't even know who the woman. Let's see. I don't know who... It's Marla. You're saying Marla's in this photo? That's Marla, yeah. That's that's my wife. Which one, woman are you pointing to? No. That's Here. Carol. Oh, is that? The oh, person okay. you just pointed to was oh, Eugene Carroll. And I, I was so shocked. I said, what did you What did you just say? <laughs> and he said, I said, that's Marla. And I was like, sir, that's Eugene Carroll. You just pointed at Eugene Carroll. 
Then Haba took her a little bit, but she realized that that was a big problem, pointed out to him that it was E. Jean Carroll, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then here's the classic Trump. Then he says, oh, yeah, 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 the photo was blurry, which I used in both my jury closings because that photo was not blurry at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then remember, he's, his, his, test, his statements to the public were, she's not my type. Yeah, right. And he's identifying this gorgeous woman in the photograph who happens to be E. Jean Carroll as his wife. Later in the deposition, I said to him, I take it all your, all your wives are your type. And he said, oh, yeah. <laughs> that, she's smart. <laughs> uh, that, that, was, that was, I think, the hardest moment I've ever had in a deposition, just to sort of Keep to not cool laugh and not react, but you you sort of know what just happened. You can't sort of show, what and you, know. you can't believe uh, it just happened. And you're just like you, you have to do the poker face thing. Right. Yeah, so yeah. We, There's had actually- lunch, we had lunch right after that day. They provided lunch. There were no complaints, and we were so happy at that lunch. Remember, Matt? Yeah, hey, you must it, have been. But that, that was actually there was two moments during during the deposition where you, we really had to, I think, play it cool. The first was the misidentification. But the second was when in the afternoon when we played the Access Hollywood tape in his sort of response to the Access Hollywood tape is fortunately or unfortunately, yeah. that's the way it is. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the. You could do anything. That's what you said. correct? Well, historically, that's true with stars. It's true with stars that, that they can grab women by the. Well, that's what it's. If you look over the last million years, I guess that's been. Largely true, not always, but largely true. Unfortunately or fortunately. And you consider yourself uh, to be a star? I think you can say that, yeah. And we, when we heard the fortunately... Stars have been able to do that for millions of years. Yeah. Yeah. It was like since time immemorial, stars yeah. have done this. Since and the cavemen. That, that did not have- help him before, even... even you know, his virtual presence at the first trial via this deposition video. I mean, that that's what that, that helped lose him that first trial. Again, big time. I him, so I take it you consider yourself to be a star. And he said, oh, yes. Um, and then on top of that, he insulted Eugene a million times. He told me I wasn't his type either. He oh, that must have really <laughs> depressed me. <laughs> I was very upset about that. Yeah. He said he was going to sue me very strongly. Very strongly. <laughs> we're going to sue you so strongly. No one has ever been sued like the way we're going to sue you. Many people are saying, people say, sir, you should sue this woman strongly. You know, you said this thing before, though, about how he is kind of funny. Like, yeah. what did you, because I think this is an underappreciated point. I'm sort of constantly trying to explain this to reporters or even to Democrats who are like, but he's so essentially repellent. Which can be true, along with the fact that he is almost charming in his own way and is funny. Like when you said the thing about <laughs> who thinks the election was stolen in 2020, he raised his hand. I would have laughed out loud in court if he did that. Uh, and it's like, but he, you know, he, he. But the thing about him is he he's funny sometimes without really knowing that he's being funny well that's sort of my question is like how how self-aware is he about how he's being or is it is it is it like he's funny in the way that he is a 78 year old man who acts like a 15 year old boy and so that is just funny or is he very cognizant of how he's engaging with people and has sort of a lizard brain understanding of how to play to people i think it's both honestly i think it's both I do think that in certain ways he has more control over himself than he's sometimes given credit for. And I think it's telling that from July or June 2019 until October 2022, he didn't say a single thing publicly about Eugene while the case was going on. He then right right before his deposition, after he had moved unsuccessfully for a stay, and it was denied, he reacted and lashed out on True Social, and then was quiet again until the trial. And then since then, I think it's been in his interest just to sort of ignore any sort of concept of preserving whatever he wanted to preserve for the court case and just go off. And so I think the fact that he stayed quiet for two and a half years, I think shows that he's able to. At some point, he decided it wasn't worth it. I'm going to dissent a little from that view i'm I, I, you know i 
you you actually sat in the room with them all that time so you know that absolutely that's worth a lot but he he can't help himself he's like a fire hose okay and it just sort of goes in one direction and it goes off in another direction and he's very very impulsive and once you get on his radar screen enough or at a certain moment it just comes out you know he just he's got a fire you know he, he, he just sort of launches in 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 a direction and i think you know the when the when when the cases when these cases reach critical moments at certain point he gets he go he he obsesses about them and then he 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 goes he goes wild and usually sometimes it's at two in the morning but that's right, i like think that's separates. yeah i think that's wow. part of what 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 we saw here um, I don't think it's I, I actually I don't think it's calculated and I don't think he's showing restraint. He's got so many things that he's outraged about that, you know, he he does from time to time move on. And that's what I think we're seeing now as much as, you know, as, I mean, obviously, the eighty eight point three million dollars has had an impact. But, you know, I, I think he's 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 got other he's got other problems. He's got ninety one problems, as I like to say. And jail is one. At one point in the first episode, my partner, John Quinn, not the famous John Quinn, I call him the good John Quinn, um, <laughs> coughed. Only, only New York lawyers will, and, and, and Los Angeles yeah, lawyers like, will get sorry, that one. Yeah, I was like, I'm sorry, this is over my head. Yeah, no, this is, a, this, is a, this is a legal industry joke, but yeah. Coughed during the deposition, and Trump was like, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you vaccinated? <laughs> and, and I was remember trying to think, like, is, is he pro-vaccination? What's he going to want? And John's like, yes, I'm vaccinated. And I said, yes, we're all vaccinated, sir. And then he was very proud. He, we had a whole little conversation about how proud he was. He kind of took credit for the vaccines. You know, Operation Warp Speed, it's the one, it's like the one good thing he did in his administration. And it's the one thing Ron DeSantis spent the whole time. Yeah, no, it's crazy. It's for. crazy. I would give him credit for that, too. Yeah. I give him credit for that. And I give him credit for getting us out of, you know, basically trying to get us out of Afghanistan. But anyway. Uh, okay. Any other, what I, I don't, because I don't know, are there any other great war stories that you guys can tell about this? Yeah, what about the trial? What am I missing from the trials? I mean, we we didn't actually get to it, I, I think, yet. But when I think the most sort of telling moment of his orientation toward the process and the trial is when during Robbie's closing, he just walked out, which I've never seen before. Um, I think most judges wouldn't let someone walk out. But he stood up and walked you out the door. I get the feeling that Kaplan was kind of letting him hang himself on his own rope in Definitely. that regard. Instead of he, any other def- civil defendant did that he, he would have the guy, he would he would have been leg in leg irons you know he would have the marshals put him back in his seat or something he just let him hang himself there i i would imagine how did the judge react i mean you guys have said judge kaplan is stern and you know kind of no nonsense but you've got a former president in your courtroom and a jury trial like was there any and and which I think could create sort of a weird power dynamic. Uh, the judge, it's his space, but Trump is used to everything being his space. And so what was the vibe like between them? Great so I think Eugene e- 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 characterizes this very well. I think what really came across is Trump looked very small in that courtroom. I mean, he was lower. He was physically lower than the judge because the judge is sitting up on the bench. Um, Ka- Judge Kaplan is at least a big as, ma- as big a man as Trump is. Yep. He really maintained order and decorum in the court to the extent he could. And when people misbehaved, he made it. Very- they didn't do it for very long. I mean, on the one hand, Trump doesn't follow the rules. On the other hand, he did follow the rules to the extent when Kaplan reprimanded him, he stopped at least for a time. And so what, what became clear, I mean, Eugene says the emperor has no clothes. Oh, stop. I know, I know, because I can't imagine it. But it, it did, he did I would feel, thought about that way. he did oh. look and feel small, I think. Yeah. I mean, it was not, he thought he was going to, it was going to be like a MAGA rally and it was going to be great for him being there. I think it was exactly the opposite. What did his face look like when the verdict came down? Oh, he had left. That's the one time he left. He left about an hour before, I think. He just wasn't there to hear the verdict get read? Correct. 
I believe that makes. Oh, that's sense. the. Well, I didn't know you could do that. Don't I mean? I guess in I, you know, my Law and Order brain, I'm like, doesn't he have to stand there at the table while the judge? That's sort reads of more like a verdict? criminal thing, but yeah, yeah, they, yeah, you, you do that. They you send show, him an email. You, being like, you, sorry, you, dude, you owe. Normally, you, if you're sitting there in the trial, you you come you. Th- th- that's what you're there for, to see the verdict. I mean, how could you miss that? I guess if you're about to get handled. All right. Like well, that. fine. What about how about? It wasn't that long a wait. I mean, it was a, the jury. Yeah, it was, was that bad. was really short. Yeah, I mean, it was they were ordering. I what mean, did uh, your face look like then? Like, how shocked were you? Let's see your happy face. With the verdict? Yeah. Oh my God, we were like holding hands uh, <laughs> with Eugene. It was unbelievable. I mean, I was. I mean, on the one hand, I, I agree with everything George has said that it's it was could have been a much higher verdict and still been sustained on appeal. On the other hand, I always kind of expect the worst. So I wish I have to say, and it, oh, here there's this great moment where uh, judge the judge's longtime deputy said, "Judge, do you mind if I ask a question <laughs> about the verdict form?" And Judge Kaplan was like, "Fine." And so the the clerk said, "His name is Mr. Mohan." Said to the four person, "What does the M mean? The letter M mean on this verdict form?" And the woman who was the four person said, "It means million." <laughs> was an awesome moment. <laughs> oh wow what you know, a moment you wrote a piece for the atlantic that you said like uh what would you what did you say it was uh you you wrote that your tears welled up in your eyes i was watching and in a when you hotel heard the verdict room, that it hit you so hard i, I was watching you know i, I all of a sudden my f- i was in florida for a field hockey tournament that my daughter was in and and we were done for the day and i was tired and I was sitting in my hotel room and wondering like when's this going to come down and all of a sudden it's verdict time I turn on the TV and I'm watching I'm watching Lisa Rubin on MSNBC who is just like she was so just stressed out in the moments before the 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 verdict came out like because it was such a moment and then when I saw the numbers on my phone or heard it on the TV it was like I, I, I was in tears I was in tears. It was like a big I, strong man with tears big, in his strong, eyes. No, seriously, it was just like wow. I mean, the, the it, it really. I, I found it quite emotional, and I, it, you know, this is a case where my involvement consisted of a single moment in time an email, and I was more emotionally invested in this case than any case, including one I got took in this to the Supreme Court. Um, in these business cases, it's just not. They just, this was just, this was about so special and about something so much more than dollars and cents. And, and, and it was about this brave woman I, 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 who, you know, who, who, who was willing to stand up to this guy. I, I just can't, I can't, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I can't. Don't get too reclamped. I lose the ability to speak when I think about it. You know, I think one of the reasons that stuff like this can feel profoundly good is because we have been living through now for seven years, just a total absence of accountability. Absolutely. Right. There just like, aren't many moments when you get the chance to say, no, somebody said this was wrong. The behavior is bad and you were going to face a consequence for it. And I think the fact that you guys got to be part of one of the just absolute rarest moments of accountability, that's got to feel amazing. really, just really good. Amazing. Let's just hope he has many more. Absolutely. Yeah, let's hope it's the first. Let me, I want to change the subject to, you know, I'm going to be Donald Trump for a second. I'm going to change yeah. the subject back to me. Me, me, me. Sure. What did you got? I mean, it, I got the impression, that, like the first trial, like, particularly in the first trial, that, that they were kind of obsessed with me. And they kept bringing... I'm totally obsessed with you. And, 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 and there was one point where they put up a slide... They were going to use a slide into summation. And the judge was like, what the WTF? Get rid of that. I mean, what, what was, I, I can't, what was Kaplan? What was Kaplan thinking when he heard, kept this, this weird drumbeat of, of like how, how Gene Carroll, Eugene Carroll got to, got to bring this lawsuit? I mean, because their defense was kind of like a QAnon conspiracy theory, right? Their, their defense was. You and me, George, got together somehow with Lisa Bernbach and Kara Martin and Eugene Carroll, and we all decided to concoct this lie to get at Donald Trump. That was their theory. That's all they had. 
Matt, is that how you see it? Yeah. And I think if you... The that makes me feel so good inside, I have to say. Story, terrible story to concoct, as Robbie said earlier. Um, it just never made any sense. But I think, as Robbie said, they were grasping a bit. Amazing. Just amazing. From beginning, you, you, what, you, what you guys accomplished here. I, I mean... I mean, to, to just sort of stick with it and to just just barrel through and, and do what needed to be done and to do it so unbelievable, incredibly skillfully, um, I, I, can't, I can't tell you how much I admire what you guys did. Well, thank you, George. Thank you. Which feels better, winning this case against Trump or getting gay marriage for the entire country? People aren't going to like my answer, and maybe just because we're living in the here and now, this case against Donald Trump. Why? That's fascinating. Because this case, because I've spent my whole life, and George is going to get, I'm going to get for Clemson, I tell this. I spent my whole life devoted to the principle that we have a rule of law, and we have a judicial system that works, and that's what makes us a constitutional democracy that's, at least until recently, was to be admired worldwide. And it was starting, I mean, it is in times looking like that may not be true. And this case validated that at least as of now, we still have all that. Thank you. Now, now I'm going to get weepy again. Yeah. I don't know. If we might have to no stop lawyer. before everyone's crying. <laughs> I know. Thank you. I mean, thank you so much. Uh, well, God this has been you. really amazing. An incredible conversation. Incredible well, what wait, you guys did. Just to did. be clear. Edie Windsor was very important. I don't want to offend anyone. It was super important. I'm married. It's important to my family, too. But you can't, as I think I said somewhere else, you can't have equal rights for gay people or for women if you don't have a rule of law. That's, yeah, and that's the, the I mean, that's, we can argue about all sorts of things, right? You can argue about tax cuts and this and that and everything that we have these processes in place to decide whether in congress or the courts and, and this one thing is everybody has an interest in this in a way that 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 I, too few people i think understand yeah i mean even thinking about I, the question i just asked the fact is uh getting being able to get married and being able to raise my family has been essential to yeah. me but the world that my kids are going to grow up in yeah is also in the country they're going to grow up in matters a great deal. And that's a big part of why I think everybody is doing the things that they're doing right now. All right, guys, we're going to let you go. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much.